Wonderful, wonderful Jesus is to me. Counselor, Prince of Peace, mighty God is he. Saving me, keeping me from my sin and shame. Wonderful is my Redeemer, praise his name. Good morning. Love to hear this fellowship this morning. But it's time for us to begin our service together with, to the Lord. Um, if you are able, would you please stand for this first song? Thank you. <clears throat> Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail. Listen, howling storms of doubt and fear assail. By the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing. Standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Amen. Please be seated. After this song, we'll be led in our opening prayer. <clears throat> bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cord that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, Lord, bind us together with love. There is only one God, there is only one King, there is only one body, that is why we can see. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, Lord, bind us together with love. Uh, before we pray, I just wanted to uh, tell those who have been praying for the project that we have got out to the uh, north of here, the new building project. Thank you for your prayers, uh, and I wanna ask for your continued prayers on that project. Uh, I tell you, it's awesome to see God providing in ways that you just don't have answers to, and it's, it's really cool. So I wanna tell you, thank you for your prayers. Uh, the doors have opened up, and answers are given like, hey, what are we gonna do here? And it's just like, oh, there it is. So it's really awesome to see that. So. Thank you for putting up with the dirt on the sidewalks that, that you know, when you have to step around. And, but, but things are going really good. It's been great weather, and I want to ask for your continued prayers on this project. So let's pray together. Father in heaven, we, uh, our sole purpose this morning is to worship you with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength. Father, we are gathered here with our brothers and sisters Father, there's no place that we'd rather be right now than to worship you, sing songs of praise to you, to uh, strengthen each other, to encourage one another, and to honor you for who you are, for what you've done, what you're doing, and what you're going to do. 
for, for, for us here while we're, while we're on this earth. Father, thank you so much for um, your son and your love that you had for us, that you saw that we needed a savior. You saw that uh, a path for us to, 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 uh, to get rid of our sin. And Father, we're so thankful, Father, and we, we give you all the honor and the glory. Father, help us to worship you with all that we have. In Jesus' name, amen. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. I am the Lord that strengthens thee. I am the Lord that strengthens thee. I am the Lord that strengthens thee. Amen. Our next song is to help prepare our minds for communing together with our Lord. Um, if you did not get a uh, cup and the bread, uh, there will be some men walking around who will uh, get that to you if you just raise your hand. <clears throat> Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior, bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood, Hallelujah, what a Savior, guilty, vile, and helpless we, spotless Lamb of God was He, full atonement can it be. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Lifted up was he to die. It is finished, was his cry. Now in heaven exalted. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Every generation aspires to be great and aspires greatness. Everybody wants to be the greatest, and we even compete to be the greatest, and we don't even admit it, but we're all trying to compete to see who's the greatest. But the greatest of all time is Jesus Christ, and we can't even stand in comparison to him. And I was reading in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 25, and it says, to whom then will you compare me, that I should be like him? says the Holy One. The more that we talk about greatness and the greatness of God, the greatness of Jesus Christ, the more it helps us understand fear and love and thankfulness for him. So Jesus is the greatest. He's the greatest ever. He was the most powerful, which led to also to the greatest love. 
And the greatest love led to the greatest descent from heaven down to earth to live the greatest life. And in that greatest life, he lived a life of, of mercy and compassion, the greatest miracles, the greatest signs, the greatest wonders, the greatest humility. And I think about it's also the greatest injustice is what it led to. The unjust trials that he went through leading to the greatest sacrifice, the greatest bloodshed, the greatest redemption, and even him providing the greatest responses to the worst sin. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. The greatest response, the greatest forgiveness to the worst sins. That led to the greatest rising, the greatest comeback, the greatest resurrection, for the greatest hope, for the greatest eternity, and not just for a few select people, but to the greatest crowd, every single person. And in that greatest gift that we have, that we've been given, sometimes it takes the Lord's Supper devotional or even the song leader that all of a sudden we gather our thoughts to remember the Lord's Supper, to remember what Jesus did on the cross. And I wanna challenge you to, I don't know where you are, but I wanna challenge you in this to start thinking about the Lord's Supper Saturday night. Because here we have the greatest of all, the greatest Savior and what he did for us, and then all of a sudden just to say, oh yeah, it's the Lord's Supper. And in fact, I'll go further than that. Man gets in the way of the Lord's Supper. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ, and all that was done for us, for the redemption that's been provided, the blood. Father, they lifted him up on that cross and the pain that he went through and help us to remember the gift that was given so that we can have eternity Help us to imagine what eternity is going to look like someday. It's hard for us to even fathom. And so right now, we go to the cross. We think about his body on that cross, the giving up of himself in humility for all of us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please bow with me. Dear Heavenly Merciful Father, we, um, we bow before you this morning. We submit to you and your love, your resounding joy for us, Dear Lord, we, we, we make mistakes, and yet we strive to stay on that path of righteousness. And dear Lord, you want us to be with you. And dear Lord, we're so grateful and thankful that, that your son who was set down on this earth and separated from you and he was sitting down on this earth and, and he saw the agony, he saw the, the, the problems and issues and, and the worst of humanity, but he also saw the good. And we are grateful for seeing that good. He saw that good. And dear Lord, we're so grateful that, that he gave willingly his blood 
didn't deserve it. And dear Lord, we're so grateful. In Jesus' name we pray. I am thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice, and it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and my will be lost in thine. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. There are depths of love that I cannot know. Till I cross the narrow sea. There are heights of joy that I may not reach till I rest in peace with thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord. To thy precious bleeding son. We've got two songs I'd like to sing together uh, before we have our lesson this morning. So would you please stand for these songs, if you're able. <clears throat> Give me the heart of a servant. Tender and faithful and true. Fill me with love and use me, O oh Lord, so that the world can see you. Lord, make me a servant. Lord, make me like you. For you are a servant. Make me one to make me a servant. Do what you must do to make me a servant. Make me like you. Open our hands, Lord, and teach us to share. Open our hearts, Lord, teach us to care. Service to others is service to you. So make us your servants, make us like you. And please be seated. Our scripture reading this morning is found in the Gospel of Luke, the sixth chapter, verse 40. A disciple 
is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. Thanks, Jim. Good morning. We do have a, another good crowd this morning, and it is good to see everybody. I do have several guests with us today. I have met a few of you as you were coming in. I uh, hope that you will stick around for a while longer and uh, let our, our members greet you and, uh, and say hello to you. I want to take you on a, on a journey this morning that I have been through uh, through this last week. It's a journey of kind of self-reflection, I guess, on my part. Uh, I, you can probably see I'm already a little emotional about this. I'll try to shake this off and get through. But uh, So just know uh, this has been a, a personal journey for me, and uh, I, I hope to, to share some of these thoughts with you uh, this morning. We have been looking at, really for this year, some ideas about growing churches. And one of the most important things that a growing church needs, or I think a church needs if it's going to be a growing church, is that a growing church has to be like their master. And, and this has kind of been the journey that I was on this week, is thinking about how can I be like my master? How, how can I be like the Savior that we just came together as a, as a body and remembered his death, burial, and resurrection? How can we be more like him? So to do that this morning, I, I want to take a look at the Gospel of John. We're going to take a look at five stories, five accounts, five examples from the first 12 chapters of the Gospel of John. Now, because we're looking at five, we're not going to get to spend much time here. I just want to remind you of these five accounts. Then we're going to come back and we're going to make some application to our lives as it comes to striving to be like our master. So these five stories, these five accounts, have some things in common. As we go through them, I'd like for you to be thinking about trying to notice what is, what is in common between these. We'll, we'll kind of bring that to fruition as we get kind of to the middle part of this, of this lesson. So let's start in John chapter 2. John chapter 2, the wedding feast at Cana. This is such an interesting story to me because this is the, the account where Jesus begins to reveal himself to the world. And in John chapter 2, verse 1, it says, On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. So Jesus and his disciples were invited to this wedding, and what I want first to understand, first of all, is that the, a wedding in the in Jewish day was not like our weddings today. We we remember this probably. You know, our weddings today last a couple hours. The weddings then lasted a few days. So if you got invited to a wedding, it was a very special time and it was a very time-consuming uh, event. So you would go for a few days. You only invited those who you truly loved, who you truly trusted, and who you truly wanted to spend some time with. So you just, you didn't throw out an open invitation and say, hey, everybody, come. You were going to invite the folks that you wanted to stay in your home for a few days. Well, did you notice there in verse 2, did you notice who got an invitation? Jesus did. Jesus was not here by accident. He didn't crash this party. He got invited. He got invited to come to a wedding feast, to spend some time. And you know what that does? That tells us a lot about Jesus. It tells us a lot about his character because Jesus was invited here. He was a person that these, this couple knew. He was a couple, this couple loved him. This couple trusted him. This couple wanted him in their presence. So as we think about Jesus and we think about him being invited here, this was a very special event. Now the second part of this I want first to notice is that Jesus was willing to take the time to go. Now doesn't Jesus have a lot to do? <laughs> you know, he's, he's got a very short period of time here where he's got to bring salvation to humanity and yet here he is spending several days at a wedding? Uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. 
Jesus took time to spend time with this couple at this feast. You know, there's three kind of big pieces that we learn about Jesus here. First of all, Jesus was available to go. Jesus was also very approachable. He got the invitation. They felt confident in him, and so he went. And we also see that Jesus was very accessible, that he was there and interacting with people. He was interacting with mom. He was interacting with the disciples. He was interacting with this couple. Jesus went to a wedding feast and was invited to go. The second event I'd like to remind us of is the account in John chapter 3 with Nicodemus. Again, account we're very familiar with. Chapter 3, verse 1 says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. So once again, we see a, a man coming to Jesus and coming for conversation. I think it's interesting that Nicodemus comes at night. We, we make kind of a big deal about that, and I really think it is kind of a big deal. I think maybe as a Pharisee, he's trying to get there without somebody seeing him. He is, he is also, maybe they were so busy, this was the only time he could get there. Coming at night is interesting. You come to my house at 9 o'clock at night, <laughs> you're probably just going to stand there and knock at my door <laughs> because I'm probably already in on my bed asleep. But they come to Jesus at night, and he just welcomes him in. He has a conversation with this Pharisee. Now, again, I want for us to think about this a little bit. Nicodemus, as a Pharisee, could have been a little bit fearful about coming to Jesus. I mean, what if Jesus turned him in? What if Jesus took this Pharisee, and by the way, the Pharisees don't like Jesus very much anyway. What if, they took him, what if Jesus took him and turned him in? What if he said, hey, this guy came to me. You guys can have... Nicodemus came. He was not worried about that at all, was he? Nicodemus came. He had confidence in Jesus. He, he had confidence and faith that Jesus was going to have a conversation with him, that he was going to answer that door, that he was going to let him in. He was confident that Jesus was not going to turn him away and say, go away from me. I'm at home. I've had a long, hard day. Now leave me alone. No, Nicodemus had confidence that Jesus was going to welcome him in. You know, I love this idea that Nicodemus was the ruler of the Jews. Again, having the confidence to come to Jesus as, as a body, this, this group of Pharisees didn't trust Jesus. They didn't like Jesus. They were mad at Jesus. They were jealous of Jesus. And yet here Nicodemus comes in. I want to take a look at a third story. This one is found in John chapter 4. Now, the main part of John chapter 4 is the woman of Samaria. We're going to skip that till next week. We're going to do this two weeks, by the way. I want to go all the way to the end of John chapter 4 and go over to verse 46. We get to the end of John chapter 4, and there's an interesting story here about a royal official. John chapter 4, verse 46. Therefore he came to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine... And there was a royal official whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and was imploring him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Now, once again, a, a, a very interesting account here of, of a person who is coming to Jesus and unlike the other two that we've looked at, this guy is a royal official. Now, chances are this guy was an official working for Herod Antipas of the day. So the, the Herod of the day, this guy probably worked for. Jew or Gentile, we don't know for sure. We do know that like in Herod's family, there was some a Jewish lineage. Perhaps in this guy there was as well. We don't know. It never comes up. Jesus doesn't even address that in this particular context. But he comes to Jesus. His son is at the point of death. Scripture says that he was imploring him. And this word, by the way, is a, a continual action begging. <laughs> Jesus, 
come heal my son. Jesus, come heal my son. Jesus, come heal my son. This wasn't just a one-time conversation. He was imploring him, begging him to come. There's a real interesting exchange. This is kind of a sidecar, but when I ran across this this week, I, need, I want to share this with you. This is so interesting. In verse 48, Jesus responds to him. So Nicodemus, or uh, Nicodemus, the, the royal official says, come to my house and heal my son. In verse 48, Jesus says to him, so Jesus is looking at the royal official, but he actually is addressing the crowd. Because he says, unless you people, that's plural. And so no doubt the crowd is gathered around. And so what is the crowd doing? The crowd has been listening to this conversation between this royal official and Jesus, and they're going, we're going to get to see another miracle. We're going to get to see another show put on by Jesus. And we're going to be amazed at this. We can't wait for this. And so Jesus, as he speaks out here to the crowd, he says, you people will not believe unless signs and wonders are performed for you. And so what does Jesus do? How does Jesus heal this man's son? Does he, does he take the whole crowd back to the nobleman's house back in Capernaum? No, he just heals him on the spot, right? He said, no, go home. <laughs> go home, your son is fine. And you can see the people in the crowd going, no, <laughs> we want her to see this. But here's what I want you to notice. If this guy was indeed a royal official that worked for Herod Antipas, what would have happened had Jesus showed up at his house with a great crowd and Jesus healed this guy's son? Do you think that's going to go over pretty good with the guys? <laughs> Probably not. I think this is an amazing account because Jesus here is so thoughtful of this man and his, his well-being. He doesn't want to embarrass him. He doesn't want to ridicule him. He doesn't want to put him on the spot and put him in trouble with the, with the guys that he works for. Just go home. Your son's well. Go home. Beautiful account here. Once again, I'd like for, for us to notice that this royal official comes to Jesus in all confidence. He comes not worrying that Jesus is going to turn him in. He comes hoping that Jesus will respond to him in a kind, compassionate way, and, in Jesus, and indeed our, our Lord does. The next account is over in John chapter 11. John chapter 11, again, a, an account that we are so familiar with, the healing or the raising from the dead of, of Lazarus, John chapter 11. This event is a little bit different from these others because... This event centers around three people that Jesus knew and that Jesus knew probably as well as anybody on the planet. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. You remember when they come to him and they tell him Lazarus is sick, the way they introduced him was, Jesus, the one whom you love is sick. And then if you look at verse 5 of John chapter 11, it says, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. What's interesting about this particular situation is that these are close friends that come to Jesus this time. You know, the nobleman probably never met Jesus. Nicodemus probably never met Jesus. They were strangers. And so a stranger can come to another stranger, you know, and have some confidence, you know, because I don't really know who you are. But these are his close friends. Jesus, Lazarus is sick, and then Lazarus is going to die. He loved him. And you remember when Jesus got there to where Lazarus was? Verse 35 says, Jesus wept. He had compassion there with the family as they mourned the death of Lazarus. Although Jesus knew he was going to bring him out of the grave, he mourned him. He had compassion. He hurt with them. In verse 38, Scripture says, Jesus again being deeply moved. Jesus responded to this situation with these close friends a little differently than he did the others. But again, Mary and Martha have great confidence in Jesus. They, 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 they are not so, so worried that Jesus is going to say, oh, I can't do that for you guys. 
You know, I'm, I'm, I'm here to do, to do miracles, but for everybody else. <laughs> no, he was there to do it for them as well. And we see that these close friends depended on Jesus. This relationship that Jesus had with Mary and Martha encouraged them to ask anything that they needed. They were invested in his life, and Jesus was invested in theirs. He was in the, invested in the lives of all of these folks that we are looking at this morning from the Gospel of John. One more event, John chapter 12, starting in verse 1. This one's kind of at the end of this event with the raising of Lazarus from the dead. And in verse 12, Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So we're back with them. They made supper there. Martha was serving, but Lazarus was, was reclining at the table with Jesus. And then Mary took a pound of very costly perfume of pure nard, came to Jesus and anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of her perfume. I tell you again, as we look at a person coming to Jesus, Mary this time comes to him and brings this very costly perfume and anoints his feet. Now, I don't think that Mary had a clue that Jesus was going to be dead in just a few days. I think she is trying to, to show him her love, her appreciation. She's trying to honor him. And so she goes to this event. Did you notice in, in later on in this story, if you remember, you remember Judas's response to this? How come this wasn't taken and sold? <laughs> Mary, what are you doing? Don't be wasting this on the feet of Jesus. As Mary comes and anoints Jesus' feet, do you think she was afraid Jesus would respond that way? Not a chance. Mary had confidence that Jesus would not reprimand her, that Jesus would not be harsh, Jesus would not be <clears throat> judgmental, no ridicule, no embarrassment. And we look at our Lord taking that event, and he allows her this great service. He, he allows her to take this costly perfume and anoint his feet. Jesus understanding this was something before my burial comes, before my death comes, and he allows this wonderful event to take place. Now, in the Gospel of John, in these, in these first 12 chapters, the, these events of Jesus interacting with people is huge. It's one of the reasons John wrote this, so that we would take a look at this and, and realize that Jesus and people <laughs> were together. Jesus came for people. He, he didn't come just for teaching. Yes, he came for teaching, but he came for people. He came to interact. So let's think then about these five stories, these five accounts, and let's think about what they have in common. Let's think about the connection that is here. I've jotted several of, this, of these down as I, as I kind of thought about them and, and, and kind of rehearsed them this week. I, I wanted to write them down so they'll be here. All five of these came to Jesus. They had courage and boldness to come to him. They had confidence in him. They were drawn to him. They trusted him. They depended on him. They were not afraid to engage him in conversation. He was available. He was accessible. And he was approachable. Jesus, in response, treated them with dignity. He treated them with honor. He treated them with graciousness and kindness. No ridicule, never a harsh word, never an attack, never a negative response back. He treated all men with understanding and compassion. 
And if you look back at these five, did you notice that these are five totally different groups of folks? We, 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 we've got some, some, some friends that he kind of knew, uh, and they were there at this wedding feast. And so kind of an interesting social event that Jesus goes there in, the, in John chapter 2. We, we go to John chapter 3, and we look at this royal official, the, the royal official, the, the event with Nicodemus in chapter 3, the royal official in chapter 4. We see that he has a ruler of the Jews and a ruler of the Gentiles. He treats him the same way. He, he then treats a man that he doesn't even know, never, never met, responds to him very kindly, folks that he knows and had known for years probably, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, teach them, treats them kindly. He treated all men with understanding and compassion. The other thing I want for us to notice that these, all, these five have in common is that he challenged every one of them to greater faith. As Jesus was interacting with these folks and as he was trying to help them as they came to him and made their various requests, Jesus always challenged them to have greater faith, to take one more step along their journey. You know, we serve the same Jesus. You and I do. And I guess as, as this is point number one, then we're finally to a point, yay. Here's point number one. Have we, do we go to Jesus in life? Do we have confidence in him? Are we drawn to him? Do we trust him? Do we depend on him? Are, are we afraid to engage him or are we okay with engaging him in what we may think are trivial things? Do we understand that Jesus is available and accessible and approachable for everything in our lives? Jesus will, teach, will treat us with dignity and with honor and with graciousness. He will not ridicule us. He will not offer a harsh word. He will not attack us. There will not be a negative response. He will treat us with understanding and compassion. And he will challenge us to greater faith. There's point number one. What, what is our connection to our master? Are, are, are we having this kind of relationship, this kind of conversation with him as we interact throughout our days? Jesus will say in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Come unto me. Jesus here is begging us. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But there's another point I want to make as we reach a conclusion to our lesson today, and this is what Jim read for us. Everyone, after he has been fully trained, will be like his teacher. So point number two is simply this. Are we reacting and interacting with people the way that Jesus did? Are we striving to be like our master? in our relationships with one another. And I, I grab these three words here because I think they are as, as descriptive to these ch 12 chapters as any as I can come up with. Are we approachable? Are we approachable by folks? Do, do we make people feel comfortable? Or, or, or are we behaving in ways that we are shunning people away from us? If we're going to be like our master in all things, we need to be approachable to them. They need to be, feel confident they can come to us and have conversation. You know, I, I uh, try to say this without tearing up, but there's a young man that has an office next to me. Well, he's not real young, but he's younger than I am. <laughs> he is about as an approachable a human being as I have ever met. It's true. I see several of you shaking your heads. It's true. Very approachable. We need to be like that. We need to be approachable to people so they can come have a conversation with us. We need to be available to them. I, I have known preachers before, and to be honest, I'm a little bit this way. <laughs> we, we sometimes go into our office and shut the door and go, I hope nobody comes in here. Every now and then that happens. 
if my door is shut, most of the time it's because I'm cold and I'm trying to let it warm up in there. <laughs> if my door is shut, please come knock on the door. I'm not trying to, to hide. But we need to make ourselves available. Our doors, if you will, need to be open. Need to be open to folks. And we need to be accessible. We need to be where people can have conversations with us. I've, I've mentioned to you before that, that I am in Lions Club. And, and I enjoy every Thursday meeting together with a group of, of community leaders and eating lunch and having conversation. I, 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 it, for me, it is something that I need to try to be like my master so that I'm out there available and I am accessible to them and hopefully becoming approachable as they enter through their lives and struggle in their time. So I want to close back with Luke chapter 6 and verse 40 and just ask ourselves the questions, are we striving to be like our master? Are we striving there? Are we making ourselves available and accessible to people? Or are we kind of closed in? Are we trying to just be a, a Christian, just be a follower in my own little box? Brethren, the world needs us. The world needs us. The world needs us to be accessible. The world needs us to be available. They need to have confidence that they can have conversation with us. And brethren, if we are going to be a growing church, let's be like our master. Let's interact with people like our master did. Well, if you have a need this morning, it may be that you just need to make a major change in your life, in your relationship with others. Make that change today. Make it. Make a commitment. I am going to be more like my master. I am going to be more open. I am going to be more available to people. I'm going to have better conversations. I am not going to be judgmental. I am not going to push people away from me. I'm going to bring them to me like my master. Well, if you need some help and the prayers of this congregation can help in that line, we want to give you an opportunity to come forward and let this congregation pray for you. You know, it may be that you have never been baptized into Christ. If you need to do that today, we want to give you an opportunity to repent of the sin problem that plagues all humanity, to repent of that, to confess that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Master and my Savior, and then embrace Him in the waters of baptism. Acts chapter 2 says that is for the remission of our sins so our sin problem can be taken away from. We come in contact with that blood as we participate in his death, burial, and resurrection. That's Romans chapter 6. We are added to the family and our Savior comes to live inside of us and we become his child. Well, if we can help you in any way this morning, would you please come? while we stand and sing. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. that need to be made. Would you please be seated?
we welcome each of you here this morning. We're glad you're here. If you're visiting with us, we'll hope you'll give us just a few moments, get acquainted, and you'll feel welcome or to come back and be with us again. But, uh, if you are visiting with us, and for our members, just a reminder that we don't pass a collection plate here. The boxes are on the tables where you picked up the communion trays, and you can leave your contributions there. We have several that we need to remember in prayer, just a list that I want to go over quickly. Uh, Billy Robinson's son, Steve, Donna Boston. Donna is now in uh, Calera, but will be going to rehab in uh, either at uh, Reba's or Karis uh, sometime in the future. Reese Cooling. Uh, Nina Boyer is in TMC and is expected to be there for several days yet. Uh, just a reminder, Jeff uh, is in Honduras. Uh, they began work there this morning. We need to make sure we remember Jeff and the group that he's with as they're there on a, a medical mission. Uh, Max House, the father of Jason House, and Jamie Ashley passed away yesterday. Make sure we remember uh, this family in our prayers. Game night is coming up this Friday night at 6 o'clock. Uh, we are asked if we can help that the sweets are needed for the wrestling awards program. They're looking for cakes, cookies, cupcakes, whatever, and uh, they're going to be feeding around 100 be providing information uh, later on with the sign-up sheet on where and uh, uh, those things are to be taken. Also, a reminder for our men that the retreat is coming up in a couple of weeks, uh, March 8 and 9 at Petty John. Uh, if you've not signed up for that, we encourage you to do so and be prepared to go and enjoy that time. If you have... just want to make you aware, trying to keep current on what's going on with the different mission projects that we're sponsoring. We now have a bulletin board for each of the different ones back here on the back wall and a, a nice banner that uh, Logan had printed up for us. Uh, it was a little difficult putting the reports up there because you couldn't get to them to see them. So this is laying on the table uh, next to the contribution box or the other table, wherever it ends up. And the current reports from different things are in here. So please take time and look, make yourself aware of the things that are going on this congregation is supporting. Thank you. We'll sing uh, How Sweet, How Heavenly before we're dismissed. Uh, would you please stand for this song? How sweet, how heavenly is the sight when those that love the Lord in one another's peace delight and so fulfill the word. Love is the golden chain that binds the happy souls above and he's an heir of heaven who finds his bosom glow with love. You bow with me. Our Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to, to come and to gather and worship you and without fear of persecution. God, we just pray um, for, for those that can't be here who are being sick or uh, that you would Put your hand on them and uh, heal them so they can be back with us. God, we just pray for those that have lost uh, loved ones that you put your comfort, uh, comforting hand on them and to uh, allow us as a congregation to uh, be there for them. God, we just thank you for this this great weather, this beautiful weather that we can get out and enjoy. And uh, God, just bring us back to the, those <clears throat> for class tonight and we can dive back in and to just learn more and to uh, fellowship together. And God, we just thank you for all the blessings that you provide for us, and it's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. <laughs>